Today is the Feast of Pentecost, the birthday of the Church, when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Apostles after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. The Acts of the Apostles record the event. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The words Holy Spirit are most often preceded by an imperative Come, come Holy Spirit as in the hymn Come Holy Ghost, Our Souls Inspire. The trouble is finding the right tone in which to command the Holy Spirit who is, after all, God. Who is this Holy Spirit, and what is he? And what should be my approach when I invoke his or her presence? Should I be bold and commanding? Come, Holy Spirit, as though I were a headmaster, demanding that Jones Minor should see me in my study right away. Or should I be more cajoling, like an old lady trying to get her cat in at night when the cat has other things on his mind. Come, 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 Holy Spirit. Or should I be like a lover trying to entice the loved one into my arms, as one might say or sing, come into the garden Maud. It's difficult to get a handle on the Holy Spirit, who he is and what she's up to, and more importantly, what she or he is going to do next. Even Jesus, who clearly knew the Holy Spirit better than anyone and promised to send him or her to the disciples, even Jesus admitted that the Holy Spirit was like the wind in the trees. You knew he was there, but you could never see him or hold him or pin him down. The Holy Spirit, says Jesus, goes where she wants to go. And yet we are praying very hard today for the Holy Spirit to come and pour his gifts upon us. And especially on those who have been baptised or confirmed in this Easter season and those who are preparing for ordination to the sacred ministry in the near future. If we are to take the account of the first Pentecost seriously, perhaps we should be really alarmed, frightened, in a panic, because if and when the Holy Spirit comes, she might come again in flames of fire and alight on our shoulders with the sound of a rushing mighty wind. We might suddenly be compelled to do things we've never done before and act so strangely that people would think we were drunk or out of our mind. If the Holy Spirit, for whom we pray, does come, then perhaps we should pray in a fearful whisper. Come, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is already here and has been part of our lives since we were born and will be with us until we die and we will be pure spirit after our death. And when we say, Come, Holy Spirit. We're not asking an absent friend to come into our lives, so much as saying that we are ready to receive him or her. Come, Holy Spirit, is a declaration about our presence, our readiness, our openness for God. God has never been away from us, which is another reason we can whisper, Come, Holy Spirit, because he's not deaf and he's much closer to us than we've ever dreamt. And when we open ourselves simply and humbly and longingly to God, something always changes in our lives. When I was confirmed, I was a bit disappointed that I didn't feel much different after my confirmation than I felt before. Nothing much seemed to have changed. For some people, the experience of the Holy Spirit in their lives is dramatic 
instantaneous and spectacular. St Paul is a good example, whose experience of Good Friday, Easter Day and Pentecost happened all in a moment as he sprawled in the dust on the way to Damascus. For many people, the encounter with God is like that, but not for all. We have to say, come Holy Spirit, every day of our lives, in order to indicate to ourselves at least that we are ready to receive whatever gifts or opportunities or new adventures God is going to shower on us this day. When we meet with God, when the Holy Spirit erupts in our lives, as he surely will when we are ready, and sometimes when we are not ready, we will be changed. Like the first apostles, we will be led into new adventures. There will be the element of surprise, of the unexpected. There will be an element of fear as we confront the unknown, the alien, the strange. But in all the doubts about our capacity to step out into a hostile or unknown world, we will also have a certainty, what Christians call faith. A certainty that we are not alone, that we are held and guided, and most of all, that we are loved. Loved by one who said to the disciples millennia ago, and still says to his followers today, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Let me read you some words from the Resurrection, an Easter oratorio which was first performed in Salisbury Cathedral 15 years ago and was subsequently recorded by the Cathedral Choir. The poem is called Faith and Doubt, because for first century Christians and for 21st century Christians, to be close to God, to receive the Holy Spirit, is both to be made certain about things and uncertain about other things. It is a curious paradox that certainty and uncertainty, faith and doubt, are inevitable consequences for anyone who is prepared to say, Come Holy Spirit. For if that prayer is answered, when that prayer is answered, we will be changed in unexpected, surprising and extraordinary ways. And that change in our lives won't necessarily happen in church, or when we are at our most godly, or on our best behaviour. It's most likely to happen when we are at our most human, when we are least closed to God when our emotions, as well as our intellect and our imagination, are engaged. In the daily transactions of living, in the simple concerns of each day, God's Holy Spirit will enter our lives, where he has been lodged for a good long time, waiting for us to say, Come. When that happens, we will be changed. Here is my poem, called faith and doubt. To see without being certain, to trust when the intellect fails, to push out from shore in all weathers and catch God's sweet breath in the sails, to find that flowers bloom in the rubble as hope disappears in the sand, to probe to the edges of meaning though truth can be held in your hand, to laugh in the face of oppression believing that love conquers all, to give when it's madness to do so, to follow because of a call, to open your heart to a stranger, saying yes when the sceptic says no, to feel for another's injustice, standing firm when others let go. In the daily transactions of living, in the simple concerns of each day, a heaven may open like blossom, like children learning to pray. The truth of God's Easter uprising beyond doubt will never be proved, but drawn by faith's deeper perception, we know through his presence we're loved. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in us.
us the fire of your love. Amen. And so we pray for ourselves, our homes, our families and friends, for our world in its need, and especially for those caught up in the turmoil of war and violence and civic insurrection. We pray for all who have lost lives and livelihoods and loved ones. We pray for all who have been infected by the coronavirus and those who care for and nurse the sick at home or in hospital or in care homes. We remember those who are shielding, those who are self-isolating, those who are most vulnerable. And as some of the lockdown measures start to be reduced, we pray especially for school children who will return to school today or in the days to come. As we remember the anxious and fearful, not least in many cities in the United States, where curfew has been imposed in response to the flare-up of racial tension and nationwide protests, we use two prayers of St Augustine of Hippo, Hippo at the end of the 4th century. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may be all holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. For you, with the Father and the Son, are our God for ever and ever. Amen. O Holy Spirit, descend plentifully into my heart. Enlighten the dark corners of this neglected dwelling and scatter there your cheerful beams. Amen. And a famous exhortation of St. Teresa of Avila, so appropriate for these uncertain times. Nada te turbe. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things are passing away. God never changes. Amen. And God bless you.